Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, I want to talk to you about Aero Spikes. Yes, you've probably heard about Aero Spikes before, uh, especially if you've played Kerbal Space Program. There is an engine in there, Aero Spike engine, which uh, is a, it performs well at all altitudes because Aero Spike nozzles are altitude compensating nozzles. You basically blow your exhaust inwards instead of uh, outwards through a nozzle. It, you blow it inwards over a spike shaped structure and through the magic of fluid dynamics, you get exhaust converted to, you know, motion converted to thrust. And it turns out the thrust doesn't vary that much with the outside atmospheric pressure. Um, and uh, I would love to talk about that, but turns out that Tim Dodd, Everyday Astronaut, did this magnum opus of a video. It pretty much covers everything and uses some amazing graphics. And I can't do graphics like that. All I could add to a video like that would be an enthusiastic hello and some very silly Scottish accent. No. I want to talk about a completely different kind of aerospike. I don't want to talk about the flamey end of the rocket. I want to talk about the pointy end of the rocket. And the aerospike is literally a spike, a pointy bit at the front of the rocket. And it's used on mainly submarine launched ballistic missiles. Uh, the idea is this spike extends forward and it changes the airflow over the front of a rocket and it reduces the amount of drag by as much as 50%. So why do they have this? Well, go back to the earliest days of the US uh, submarine launch ballistic missile fleet. Uh, you start with the George Washington class and it loads up with Polaris missiles. These are the sort of first generation missiles they have. They're single warhead, you know, two stage solid rocket motors. And they're fine, but the range is only like two and a half thousand kilometers. And there's definitely a desire to increase the range of the missiles because the longer range you make the missiles, the more flexibility you have on where you deploy your submarine fleet. So the Polaris evolves, it becomes the Poseidon. They actually figure out they can make slightly bigger missiles by stripping out some of the lining in the tubes, letting them fatten them up. Uh, the Poseidon can carry like, I think, three warheads. But then we get the Trident, which is like the third version, I guess, of the nuclear missiles being launched from uh, submarines. And for this one, it'll be able to carry eight warheads, all targetable on their own, and they will have a third stage at the top of the Poseidon. The problem is that the missile is basically exactly the right length to fit into this tube. And their solution is instead of having a pointy nose, they switch it to having like a round, you know, blunt nose. And that means that the volume of the missile actually increases while the length doesn't change. So the third stage is actually a very skinny solid rocket motor that extends up into the middle of this fairing at the front of the rocket. The eight warheads are arranged in a circle around this on their deployment platform. And the problem, of course, then, is you've now fitted a third stage in there with more warheads and more performance, but you have a nose which has a lot of drag on it. And that really is cutting into your extra range that you're buying. Sure, you are getting extra range from that third stage, but you're wasting a lot of energy early on in the atmosphere as you are fighting against the Mach effects, the aerodynamic drag of that bow shock hitting that blunt nose. So they incorporated a deployable aerospike. This is basically a telescoping rod that would be driven by a gas generator. Interestingly, the circuits and controls for this are largely isolated from the rest of the rocket. I think it gets power, but because they have to be able to take this nose cone or this like fairing off, service stuff and put it back with regularity, they don't have a huge amount of complex connectivity back to the rest of the vehicle. It has like its own accelerometer, its own clock. It knows when it's been accelerating at a certain rate for long enough that it should fire up that gas generator and deploy this spike. They actually, there's a really, well, there's a fairly extensive paper that Lockheed Martin published on how they developed this. They went through more than one iteration on the gas generator because they found that early on, it would expand too quickly and blow itself out. So you would have a not fully deployed spike. Um, so anyway, yeah, this would this will deploy out a few seconds after the vehicle starts accelerating. And once the rocket starts hitting like supersonic speeds, 
instead of having what happens is this point that sticks forward it starts to generate like the shock waves in front so the bow shock is no longer attached to the front of the vehicle it's attached to this spike and it stays far away from this so a shock wave, of course, as you've got the incoming air is supersonic relative to the rocket. Once it crosses this, it becomes subsonic and it is, you know, therefore producing less force on the rocket itself and less heating. In addition, if you've got the thing set up right, you can have these like recirculation zones where the air is sort of coming in an oblique shock and the air forms like a little vortex around the top that again reduces pressure more and keeps the temperatures kind of cool. So these would be deployed on the, the early Trident and apparently this small like nose change would basically give them like 550 kilometers extra range which is quite amazing. Now it does have its limitations. They uh, figure out that the drag reduction is about 50%. There's a sort of minimum length you need before it really starts becoming fully functional. You want to make sure that the cone of shock waves that it's generating aren't impinging on the rocket. Once you go beyond a certain amount of length, it doesn't really help you anymore. The longer the length, the less you can steer because as you begin to steer this vehicle to, to say, you know, retarget it, you're moving the body of the rocket at an angle to the airflow and that conical you know shock cone is going to come down and hit your rocket and if you've got a shock zone hitting your rocket that is a very dangerous place to be it's putting a lot of energy into a very small amount of space and that could be even worse than not having this uh, spike uh, now you know obviously it's better if you have a missile to have just like a pointy rocket to start with this is mainly for the case where you have to fit something into a certain amount of height and you want to get that drag reduction so this will pop out during flight. So the three submarine launch missiles that I know use this are the Trident which was like the older one then there's a Trident 2 which only fits in the new or the newer <laughs> the Ohio class submarines which had longer tubes. France has one called the M51 which uh, again will fit into their tubes and, and launch. There's also uh, a Soviet Igla like a man pad, right? Human, you know, handheld, uh, man portable air defense system. That's what man pad means. It's basically shoulder launch surface to air missiles. And these things have a teensy, teensy, tiny little aero spike that pops out after the thing launches. I guess it makes the thing slightly shorter. And I think it also allows them to put guidance sensors in a more uh, meaningful form factor, right? Because, you know, having a nice rounded front for your optics is a little easier than trying to make them shoot through like a pointy cone. So anyway, uh, one thing I should say is we call them aero spikes here, but the thing at the front isn't normally a spike because it turns out that it's better to have uh, like a blunt body at the front. On the Trident, it looks more like an aero disc where you've got this thing pointed up and then it flattens out into a disc and that moves the shockwave around a little better. I've seen designs that use hemispheres and those have been tested. Um, but there's other ways to improve the performance. One thing that's been experimented with is you basically have a series of vents at the top and you inject cold gas through into this and this refills the recirculation zone and keeps the nose of the rocket colder. This obviously has applications if you're, say, flying at hypersonic speeds and trying to maintain that flight for as long as possible because it means that only your tip is, is really experiencing the full heat of everything and you're cooling the rest of the rocket. There are ideas where there is not a physical spike involved, but you've got some sort of energy-driven system that just blasts out uh, you know, the air and disturbs it in some way. There's one example I've seen in a wind tunnel that uses uh, a laser, high power laser that shoots down, disrupts the air, and the shockwave sort of expands out and misses the rocket. There are ideas that do this with microwaves, creating them, focusing them down to a point, creating like a plasma again, which is exploding in front of this blunt nose to reduce the drag. There's even some crazy ideas out there where there's, it's called a lenticular beamed power like spaceship where it's basically a flat disk which is receiving microwave power from below it, 
focuses that to a point, generates the explosion of like plasma, and then uses that, the power from below, couples of the plasma, accelerates it using magnetic fields and it flies forwards like a UFO, except it's flying straight upwards in a way that doesn't seem natural, but I am assured is somewhat compatible with the laws of physics if you can get the amount of energy required to make this happen. And then underwater, much more dense than air, you have super cavitating torpedoes. Now these are not quite the same as aerospikes, but they are worth talking about because people will bring this up. Basically it's a high speed torpedo that blows gases into the water in front of it. So it's basically flying through a bubble of gas propelled by rockets with little fins that stick out into the water around it. Apparently, the, like the Rus Russia or Soviet Union developed a uh, super cavitating torpedo in the 70s and has been deployed. The US apparently demonstrated in a test a supersonic like Mach 1 sub underwater torpedo in the 90s. It's not clear that that's ever been deployed, but you know you can see how these things that actively change the medium through which they are flying can certainly make the world a lot more slippery and slidey and faster. Uh, finally, I should probably make it clear that while uh, we do have aircraft that will have spikes that stick out into the airflow, that's not usually for modifying the airflow for drag purposes. That's usually you will put like instrumentation out on the tip so it is getting the cleanest airflow before the rest of the aircraft's body disrupts things and messes things up. So look, this is just a kind of short video on the idea because I thought it's it's cool that there's more than one kind of aerospike. Uh, if you're going to be searching about this, it's good to maybe search for drag reducing aerospike or aero disc. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff out there, a lot of cool computational fluid dynamics. It's definitely, uh, yeah, mind-blowing. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.